it's nice to be able to talk to you guys at the circular economy. Uh, my name is Sally Gurner, um, and I'm supposed to do a little introduction here, so bear with me. <clears throat> I'm sort of an odd duck in all of this. I started out as a high tech engineer doing research and development in all sorts of things and early cell phones and early uh, <clears throat> desktop computers and things like that. But then I switched to my what was my true love, which was uh, psychology, only to find out that my engineering and sci uh, science mind was not really well suited for the science that they were doing in psychology. So I went off searching for something else and just stumbled across this group of system scientists who I see as the heretics of the new um, Copernican flip. And what they introduced me to was this idea that science in general is switching from a uh, mechanistic, materialistic, single cause, simple causality model to a systemic um, energy-based, completely inter intersecting kind of, uh, interconnected kind of thing. And what we can do now is that the new advances in what I call system science, which is taking place, emerging under a whole bunch of different names in different fields. Um, it gives you a much more logical and integrated and rigorous way of looking at human systems in particular, which is what I've always been wanting to do. <clears throat> so anyway, so I switched over and found this wonderful dream team um, group of, of dissertation advisors. So I did my second PhD in system science. Anyway, and I've been traveling the world ever since trying to put the pieces together for how this all works. And now this brings me to most recently economics and particularly to circular economies. So I'm going to start off with two quotes from people who are working in systems, uh, pardon me, circular economies. Um, because they sort of sum up the whole substance of this talk, which it goes like this. The circular economy stands at a crossroad between true systemic change and rebranded business as usual. We argue that the circular economy is set up for failure precisely because it is required to conform to our current market system. As long as the circular economy exists within the confines of those market system rules, it will produce outcomes consistent with them. I think that just hits the nail on the head for me. The other part of it is the world economy is presently at a historical inflection point. The neoclassical industrial model of economics is self-destructing while a new life mimicking model is based on radically different assumptions is emerging. So that was from, the first one was from Thomas Sidarius and Trevor Zink and the second one was from Joseph Bragdon. Both of them I think are spot on in terms of what's happening today. So the summary of what I think is going on today is, is we're having a new, completely different understanding of what makes a society thrive. And the one that's emerging makes much more sense over the, when you get down to thinking about it. It's gonna be, I think it's, eventually people are gonna look back and, at what I call now oligarchic capitalism, which is not what capitalism started out to be. Um, and they're going to uh, see it as basically the same kind of thing as flat earth people. Um, it just doesn't make any sense when you have all of the facts and all of the different information. Anyway, so I would say that today's systemic crisis is driven by an economic belief system that puts elite profits over people and planet. And the only way to build a sustainability, uh, a sustainable civilization is to develop a more accurate vision of what makes human systems thrive. And the broader story of circulation, which I call energy systems, but I think you will probably know it more as living systems theory or also resilience and regenerate, regenerative economies are also basically working in the same field as energy dynamics. Anyway, it provides the more logical, rigorous and integrated vision of systemic health we need to chart a course to sustainable vitality. So if we put these we have this contrasted vision between oligarchic capitalism, which fundamentally creates its government by the rich for their own advantage, according to Aristotle. And it's, it in, impacts the way we look, approach all sorts of systems. So social systems, 
We, it advocates exploitation and expendability. Media, it's manipulation and sens sensationalism. Education is basically don't think, obey authority. And economies is profit over people and planet. And this kind of a system thrives by maximizing profit for elites, regardless of the cost of people and planet, treating workers as costs to be minimized, upping GDP, regardless of how money is made or how it is used, providing tax breaks and bailouts and subsidies for big corporations and elites, and externalizing the costs of public and, and ecosystem services. In this view, bigger and more efficient are always better. The rich deserve whatever they can get. Gross inequity is inevitable. And there is no alternative to the eco economic system we have. In contrast, if you take an energy system point of view, you will say that we're trying to become a regenerative learning society, which nourishes cross-scale vitality. Such a society would thrive by nourishing human capacities, infrastructure, and commons, building common cause culture and effective collective learning, robust cross-scale circulation of money, resources, and information. <clears throat> maintaining a balance of large and small resilience and efficiency and maintaining reliable inputs and healthy out outputs. In this view, big and small are both necessary. Excessive concentration, monopolistic dominance and cultural pollution are deadly. Gross inequity is the result of oligarchic policies and learning and reform are critical today. So that's it in a nutshell. So I'm not going to give you a little bit of the physics that goes with this. So in terms of cir circulate regenerative, invest in human capacity, socioeconomic infrastructure and common, the obvious reason to do this is because they're, it's human networks and their support systems that do all the work. And if you don't nourish them, if you don't feed them, then you're going to basically, call your, your economy and your society are eventually gonna collapse because they're gonna become br uh, brittle. For me, there's this kind of strange sense for me because when I first got into economics, the idea that you wouldn't that this wouldn't be obvious is just kind of hard for me to believe. But people like Donella Meadows were, had to work really hard at, to convince people that there wasn't an infinite amount of resources and and that it didn't matter and that it mattered if you had healthy outputs that were poisoning the planet or people. Anyway. So instead of circulating money and re resources robustly across scales, because, well, poor circulation will cost creates necrosis. So where money goes is particularly important. Oligarchic capitalism just, it basically doesn't care where money goes it's, it, as long as, I mean, GDP is only a measure of the amount of money being circulated, not how it's being used or how it was made. Or, anyway, we can get into that for later, but anyway. The more unusual thing that energy systems has to offer is this idea that we have universal patterns that, are, that apply to living, non-living, and super-living systems. So my own background it comes from, has a lot to do with fractals and nonlinear dynamics, which is really arcane way of talking about the natural and universal geometries of behavior. So if you look around in the world, you see these uh, fractal balances of small, medium, and large, or power law balances. So that there's, so if you look at trees or lungs or ecosystems or river deltas or um, circulatory systems or, and ecosystems themselves, you find this balance of small, medium, and large. And it, it's actually a mathematically precise balance of small, medium, and large, because that particular arrangement optimizes circulation and function across scales. So if you're if it's your circulatory system, you need you know veins and in order to reach every nook and cranny, but you also need arteries in order to uh, optimize the speed of cross scale transit. And the same basic ideas hold in terms of banking systems. So you need small banks that support small scale commerce. And you need medium banks or regional, or regional banks or regional support networks and large banks for large scale international needs. It's just that there's also, the fractals allow you to understand that these are all, all sizes are important because the organization needs entities that are just right to serve the needs of each level. Anyway, the other part of it is that if you have too many of the big guys, this is a basic law of ecosystems, but it's true in 
uh, fractal systems in general, which is excessive size, power, efficiency creates a more you have, the more you get feedback loop that drains lower levels and creates necrosis. So if you have too many predators in an ecosystem, they will eat up all the play and prey and, and eventually they'll collapse too. Well, the same basic idea holds with banks. So if you have too many large banks and they basically suck up all the resources from the small scale, uh, small scale commerce, then eventually you're gonna get what I call economic necrosis, which is the dying off of large swaths of economic tissue. Um, so <clears throat> this is really a contrast. The, the other way of looking at this is, is, what, I, is what Bob Alonowitz, who is a theoretical ecologist I've worked with for many years, calls the window of vitality, which is a balance of efficiency and, and resilience because the big guys provide this cross-scale efficiency and the little guys provide the diversity and numbers that provide resilience in case of change and also because they're more appropriate for the local scale. Okay. Now, of course, for me, the most interesting thing about energy is that it provides the basis of both information and organization, and it allows us to tie the two together. So nowadays you have, I mean, the idea that we can bounce radar waves or ultrasound waves off it, into the ground and, and, you know, like in archaeology, you'll be able to see things that are underneath the ground. That's actually energy in the form of information telling us what's actually going on in a particular area, even though you can't actually see it. So in energy allows us to take that kind of energy wave information in which we are swimming in a sea of it. And, and it has the physical capacity to trigger small scale, uh, trigger activity in the organization so that you get this ability to un understand why it, you naturalize intelligence. You understand why adaptive response to information is central to living systems ability to survive. So in this kind of view, the main difference between living and non-living systems isn't genes. It's the ability to respond to information coming out from outside in order to find your food. So, and it's built on an integration of all these previously previous energy system, things like metabolism and, and finding coercive, uh, pardon me, the lining of different cells in order to hold things together. All of those things came together and we know that they, you know, they emerged spontaneously in the natural environment. But when they came together and, and it allowed you to, in a way that allowed you to both respond to information and preserve it, it provided a, a whole new stage of existence. Now these sta this stage of existence actually works better when it is naturally self-nourishing, which is what life does. So it, goes out and it finds food and it uses that to nourish its own internal processes. So it keeps on going, that's how it persists. However, as life gets, grows bigger, there's another energy law called the surface volume law, which says that as you get bigger, the bonds holding the system together get stretched thinner. And they, you know, so the reason an embryo divides into two at a certain size of cell is that it, those bonds break at a particularly mathematically precise point, ratio of the volume to the surface area. This happens repeatedly. So each time the system grows, it multiplies and comes in order to get bigger, it has to uh, grow bigger it, and develop, it has to come a couple back together. Anyway, over time, what this does is it means that these cells that which were themselves responding to information have to stay in sync in order to provide the, the, the functions that this multicellular organism would needs to have to stay healthy. And to do that, it, it's at the beginning, it just has this, it, you know, a cell will exert an electrical charge or murder chemical, release a chemical that allow it to stay in constant communication with its fellows. But at, after a certain point, they grow apart and it's the invention of this nerve cell that allows it to get bigger. 
and after and that pattern repeats so it after getting to a certain level it gets bigger and bigger and you have to have multicellular nerves multi cylinders need multiple nerves in order to stay together and eventually you get um the communication with the brain um so this the basic idea here is that in order to get bigger, you have to have internal communication that keeps it keeps all the different cells in sync. And the same process holds out with, with human beings so that we're not only a collaborative species, why we're a social species, but we specifically pool information and revise our behavior by changing our beliefs. This makes us a categorically different it's not just uh, humans, obviously, it, it actually is animals, multicellular animals in general do this communi internal communication and processing of information to stay healthy, makes us a collaborative learning species. Um, and we've sort of optimized this anyway. But this means that health depends on synergetic collaboration, commitment to the to common cause, and collective learning, not just for learning wrote of what's come before, but learning aimed at the health of the whole. Um, this in turn means that accurate information and open honest processing are also critical health, as is connective tissue from roads and media, roads to media. In this view too, cultural pollution and deceit and division are deadly, which is very different from what we get under oligarchic capitalism. So oligarchy, believes that vitality comes from self-interest and competition among amoral rational agents. Self-interest is the centerpiece of economic evolution and human nature. We are automatons as run by selfish genes, according to Richard Dawkins. Values aren't necessary because free markets find optimal ways automatically. Deceit, distortion, division, and blocking critical reforms are accepted tools for maintaining elite power and profit. Okay. So thanks to the, these universal patterns, which are snowflakes, they have both, they have universal mathematically, geometrically precise patterns that are going on, but they are also infinitely unique. Anyway, so, but the, the measure, the quantitative ge geometries allows us to have quantitative measures of systemic health. So the, this is the list of our, my research groups top 10 measures of societal health. Um, and for regenerative circulation, there's cross-scale circulation, regenerative investments, reliable inputs and healthy outputs. And for resilient structure, it's a balance of sizes, balance of resilience and efficiency, sufficient number and diversity of roles. And here, and for common cause values, it's degree of mutualism and constructive versus act extractive activity. And then, of course, there's collective learning. Now, the ones that are highlighted in yellow have just recently been applied to a Greek island, Samothraki, by a group in um, Erasmus University in Rotterdam. <clears throat> we haven't, they haven't been able, and these can also be done by socioeconomic -meta socio metabolisms kinds of measures that are already exist and putting them in the network uh, forms that developed by <clears throat> Brian Fath and Dan Fiskus and Robert Ilanowitz. Um, so that they're pretty straightforward in terms of calculation, calculating these measures, but the problem is we haven't got the measures for reliable inputs, healthy outputs, balance of sizes and constructive constructive versus extractive and collective learning. So we're working on those. <clears throat> anyway, so if we sum up, then oligarchies violate the laws of systemic health. They learn poorly, circulate inadequately, concentrate excessively, drain lower levels, and sow dis disinformation and division. There's ample ev evidence that oligarchies' to toxic beliefs are destroying us socially economic and economically as well as environmentally. So the first one on the far left is <clears throat> a diagram of, of global GDP from 1980 to 2010. And this is basically showing the impacts of investment uh, in speculative exchanges like derivatives, currency exchanges, et cetera, versus real goods and services. And so you will notice that 
the amount of money actually being invested in the real uh, economy are, is maybe what these days is maybe one fifth or one fiftieth of the uh, amount that go, goes into speculative, which are non-constructive activities. Um, <clears throat> removing too many constraints promotes excessive concentration and instability. Um, this is seen easily in the, the period from the Gr uh, Great Depression and, and Franklin Den Delano Roosevelt's implementation of, of well, basically a lot of constraints on <clears throat> monetary oh, <laughs> craze and credit. And, you know, so he started, he started a, in, intense um, progressive tra taxation and he started constraints on who could lend money to whom and how much. And this led to a 50 year <clears throat> period of unprecedented stability in the financial sector until regular Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan came in and started the deregulation and created the savings and loan crisis. And then again, we're, we've deregulated even more and now we've bailed out um, the banks in the 2008 crisis. So we're now we're reinflating the bubbles again. <clears throat> anyway, the other, the more interesting one for me is also that a recent study by Gillens and Page uh, looked at how, what the probabilities of getting uh, a policy passed were depending upon elite's preference versus the public's pre uh, preference. And it turns out that there, there's a fairly strong correlation between elite's preference and what gets passed, but there's essentially no correlation with the public's preference and what gets passed. So... On the upside, this kind of behavior creates internal pressures, which we're seeing all sorts of these days. Um, so we're periodically driven to learn better ways because these, these oligarchies basically create a wealth sucking vortex that concentrates wealth and erodes systemic health from the inside out. But the internal resulting internal pressures drive societal learning and reform. Now, the problem here is that there is no guarantee when you get to a, a bifurcation point, a crisis point, whether there will the system will go up or go down. And we're basically on the cusp of great change right now. So, so there we are. <laughs> I, I can't say that we, you know, we're definitely going to make this a better world, but we now have the tools, I think, and the concepts that are going to help us if we wanted to, if we could invest the time and money into it, um, actually make this a better world. So we are definitely in this year, we're called on to be the architects of the future, not its victims. Anyway, I'll leave with this last thought, which is if you want to understand societal health, you'd better first understand how belief systems shape human behavior and how closely beliefs match nature's own laws of sustainable vitality. This is from Howard Odom, who is a fairly famous system scientist in the late 20th century. Um, and his, he was actually the one who got me into all of this because he was both an, uh, an eco, a system scientist, but he was also, his father was the, had founded this school of sociology in, at University of North Carolina, where I lived. Um, <clears throat> and so he was already a, a uh, approaching uh, the human systems with an energy systems point of view back in the 80s and 90s. So anyway, that's my talk. <laughs>